take at least 10 to 15 years to achieve what you were looking for. We are talking about almost like a, a full generation mission to bring something new. And for us, of course, the most difficult part is to achieve that, to be very picky and demanding to the, the vineyards, but also to the team, to do the best that they can offer, to make a wines which is very precise, very racy, very nice. Sit back and grab a glass. It's Wine Talks with Paul K. Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul Key, and we are in studio today about to have a conversation with Thomas Schlumberger, and some call him Schlumberger, but we'll get to that in just a second. <laughs> hey, hey, push the subscribe button right now. Also, give me a review. If it's not a good review, forget it. If it's a nice one, go ahead and leave it. Uh, that's what has, helps us podcasters move the needle on our show, but su su subscribe and have your friends subscribe as well. You're going to have a conversation with Thomas Schlumberger. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So do you call yourself CEO, uh, le chef, uh, the patron? The owner, the CEO, the owner, a little CEO. bit of everything. You know, you said something last night, and we had dinner together, and Trace had incredible wines, and we're going to talk about that. But you work with your sister. I do, which is not always easy. But... No, I could never do that. <laughs> uh, you know, from time to time, it works. <laughs> yeah, all right, so, so you have different disciplines, like you're in charge of and she's in charge of. Yeah, we try to split a little bit the... The role in the company, so I'm more into administrative, you know, like all the boring stuff. And she's yes. the face of the company, traveling a lot, promoting the wines. And it's a fantastic team. Wow. We are very, you know, working together in a good way. Because we, I, my, my sister and I just got done, she's two years older than I am, with a transaction uh, from my father's estate. And, you know, there was a little contention there. It was, you know, it didn't go exactly the way we wanted, as smooth as we wanted to, but we, we, we got past it. And, yeah, it's a matter, it's a working process, you know. You need to work on it. You need to, to have a, some communications going on. Right. But, uh, you know, we have different personalities, and I guess that's the strength. You can really work in a different way, but we have the same goal, the same philosophy, and that's what matters the most. And it gives, uh, I guess, a different perspective. Absolutely. You know, yeah. the Clovis Tétanger, he works with his sister. That's true. Right? You know, yeah. so. <laughs> I don't know if it's better or worse than to work with your wife, for example. Well, when you walked in, I, she's not here today. She's coming home from New York. But 25 years, we worked together selling wine. So yeah, um, she was the controller. Yeah. You know, she, you know, she w I wouldn't say that I was the president. It was more of a, you know, a name more yeah. than it was <laughs> responsibility. But, but, you know, you traveled here during the middle of harvest, which is incredible. And you made a great point last night during the dinner. But... Um, was that tough to do, to get a walk away from harvest? It's very difficult. It? Yeah, it's yeah. very difficult because this is the, the key season for us. This is where everything is going on. You, you will really consider that it's the most important time for us during the year. But I had to find a very good excuse. Yes, so That's course. why I'm here. That's what I was Just for well, the show. <laughs> Mr. Chow in Beverly Hills yeah. is a good excuse, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the harvest in, in, uh, in Alsace this year is a looking... Uh, voluminous is it uh, a lot of uh, you, you're going to get a lot of yield or was it a hot year because of the climate change what's so what's it looking like every vintage is very different of yeah. course this one is a little bit difficult because uh, we had a lot of rain in Alsace, mm -hmm. which is not usual Alsace is considered as the driest place in france really yeah because of that. the vosges mountain the local mountain which make a natural barrier uh, from the bad weather so usually we have the very small rainfall, mm -hmm. but this year, again, it has been different. So a lot of rain all year long. Um, so a season which is not easy, uh, and this is where we can stand because we have a full control from the vineyard to the bottle. So we can really take and pick up the grape at the right time. We have a full control of what's going on. So I always tend to say that this is where the great producer can make a difference. It's not on a, you know, easy and perfect vintage. It's where it's becoming a little bit more difficult and complex. So this, this, my romantic view of wine, which, you know, we know that our job is to sell wine and wine is consumer driven. We want to present to the public what uh, we think they want to taste and drink and experience. Um, it, but you're the seventh generation? Yes, that's correct. Wow. So... I wonder, and you, your father before you, yeah. And did you know your grandfather when he was working? In, no, no, I never met him. You never met him. Okay, so this, there's something unique about this that we don't get in America. Or we're starting to have now generationals, uh, 
but wine is business in the U.S. You know, it's not as generational. It's not like even food in France, where uh, you know there's protected regions and there's protected ideas and there's protected grapes and protected wine regions. So generationally, it's more important uh, in Europe than it is in America, right? And so I wonder what your grandfather's approach to this was. Was it to produce the best he could get out of the vineyard and his father and his father and his father, like express Alsace, or was there other? It has been a little bit different back then but because my great-grandfather was in charge during the Second World War. Wow. And of course, that was a very difficult time for the entire region. And it was more for him uh, an idea of saving the vineyards, first of all. Mm -hmm. Not even talking about quality and how good the wines can be, but just to save the vineyards on this specific location. So we are based in Gebwiller, a small village in the southern part of Alsace. And you have to imagine that the vineyards that we own is on the hillside. Have a listen to a show I just released with Angelica Mabray. She is the director of Donum Estates in Napa and sort of spearheading this experiential part of our wine trade where you go to a winery, you're not just tasting and having a conversation. You are touring, and they've got one of the greatest collections of art in any winery in the world there, and she is doing an incredible job of moving the needle with their 21 different Pinot Noirs. And I had a conversation yesterday, a pre-call conversation. I was absolutely flabbergasted and floored by Stephanie Franklin. Actually, the second Stephanie Franklin I've interviewed in the show. But she is planting a winery in a place called Shankleville, Texas. Yes, I know. I don't know where it is either. But it's not part of the wine trade that we know of. But the reason she is growing grapes there, her great-great-grandfather founded the town and it was a post-Civil War uh, black American freedom town. And it's an incredible story about how she landed there and is, wants to produce wine. And it's kind of what we need in this world today. But It's on a mountain, mm -hmm. very steep. So after the, the Second World War, uh, and even before that, during the First World War, everything was back to scratch. Uh, especially in the 1920s, we were after the Philoxera crisis, after the First World War. So nobody wanted to plant vines anymore on the steep slopes. So in most cases, they just, uh, you know, quit. They didn't produce vines anymore. Or they decided to move towards the plain of Alsace. And that was an opportunity for my great-grandfather, mm -hmm. Ernest Schlumberger, who decided to invest the money from the family into the land. But his idea was really to save the place. He, he realized right away that that was very unique in many aspects. I mean, the land that we are carrying in the family, uh, the terroir that we use, uh, so unique, so beautiful, that he has to put all his, his energy into that and Very to true. save the vineyard. You know, that's an interesting thought because uh, when World War II came and the Nazis took over, you know, they cut France in half almost and the occupied side, Bordeaux, uh, we talked about this before, about the Weinführers of the four main districts of France and that the, the Third Reich had, you know, standing orders for Alsatian wine, standing orders for Champagne, standing orders for Bordeaux, uh, for Hitler, who didn't even drink. You yeah. know? So, But it was interesting that you say that your grandfather was trying to save the vineyard because World War I, uh, the Prussians destroyed the vineyards. They just devastated the places. I mean, there, I guess there's places in Champagne, they can't even grow still because of the phosphorus in the ammunition. And here, World War II comes around. They go, no, we, we want to save these things. We want to, <laughs> we want to drink the these vineyard. wines, right? <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, there's some pretty good stuff coming out of there. But, but still, regardless, uh, is it because there was no labor during the war uh, because everybody went to go fight that the vineyards were neglected? Is that what... And also because Alsace, unlike the rest of France... We changed five times nationality yeah, that's true, in right. about 150 years. So when the German invaded France, we, we became German by the time they were, you know, winning the, the war. And then when, of course, at the end we won the war, we became French again. And that happens during the two wars, the first one and the second wow. one. So we have a very unique history, which makes Alsace to be very specific. I mean, when you look at Alsace nowadays, it's still a mix of those two cultures. 
we have still a, a German identity, which is still alive nowadays, mm -hmm. with a mix of this French culture. Of course, we are now French. There is no doubt about yeah, right. it. Until now, <laughs> yeah, at <course>. least. <laughs> but, very proud of that, of course. But we tend to say that, you know, this mix is, I would say that we are a little bit like the German. We wake up early in the morning. We are well organized. We work hard but also a little bit like the French, taking hours for lunch and dinners, drinking yeah, right. a lot of wine. <laughs> so it's a very interesting culture. Is that the best of both worlds? Of course, you, I guess it's kind of like Bolzano, Italy, where you can get schnitzel and pasta at the same restaurant, and here you can get cassoulet and, uh, and, uh, and schnitzel. The yeah, same, <laughs> no, that's exactly the same. <laughs> and as soon as you are living close to a border, there is always a mix between the culture of your own country and the one right. next to it. So is there a dialect that's still, there's sort of a there German, is still French a dialect. dialect? Yeah, it's mostly German sounding with yeah. a, a few French words into it. And it's only spoken. So there is no there's writing no about it. Uh, and we tend to lose it, you know, as any of this tradition. I mean, the young people tend to use a little bit less this dialect. Because I sense a little German accent there, a little part coming from your yeah, French maybe. accent. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking yesterday about... Uh, and the wines, the wines last night were amazing, and because they were so ter terroir driven, I mean, you you sensed uh, the appellation in the different vineyards, and you also sensed the time. You know, the the different part of you know the different. I'm sorry, the different vintages. Yes, and you could tell that there was dramatic differences uh, from one year to the next in what you produced. And I had the, my romantic view of wine is that that's what we're supposed to do, that it, that we let the vineyard drive what that wine is going to be and best express as we can and bring it to the table. But you say it all. I mean, that's exactly our philosophy. Uh, you cannot fight against your terroir. You need to deal with it and to take the best part of it, to make wines which reflect a specific location, a specific weather conditions, a specific uh, uh, way of, you know, dealing with your estate and uh, the, 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 the ability to to work with it in a positive way and to, at the end, have a wine which is very authentic. And I guess that's what we are driven by. I mean, we need to, we really need to deal with the nature, to deal with the, the specific place. And uh, after 200 years, we get a feeling that, you know, we start <laughs> to understand it a little bit, but it's a working, again, a working progress because we, we always evolved with, you know, like the different vintages which are becoming extreme in one way or another. Right. Uh, and we need to adapt all the time to experiment, to, to be smart, to, to try new techniques. To, and that's what really is exciting for us. You, I, I love that term, you cannot fight terroir. Yeah. Like, why would you fight the terroir? Right? So the whole idea is why fight it because you're supposed to produce that. But then, you know, the, the consumer side of wine, which we deal with every day when you go to the supermarket you know, supermarché you know here in los angeles you see the same stuff from shelf to shelf yeah and those are those are not terroir driven wines they are not driven by this history you have but they are the wines that people come to the table to drink their first time maybe they're a little sweeter maybe they're a little you know they're they, it's the same character every every vintage because they try to do that but i think every generation comes to the table one day and tastes an Alsace Riesling or an Alsace Gewürztraminer and says, oh, I get it now. Yeah. And it's because I think you are expressing that moment in time. Yes. And we don't try to follow the trends. You know, that's not what we are doing. We right. are really trying to do and to express the best, uh, in the best possible way, the terroir that we have. And uh, there is no other way for us. I mean... I always take this example of, uh, uh, I'm born with, f four, I mean, we were four siblings. So yes. four kids in the same family, born and raised in the same way, but with a different character. Mm -hmm, and this is mm -hmm. something that you can never change. So you need to learn to deal with it. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, thought. And, right? uh, and I guess as we have four terroirs, four Grand Cru, for us it's exactly the same. Sometimes you wish you could produce a specific vintage a little bit drier or a little bit rounder. Uh, but at the end, there is nothing much you can do about no, right. it. And you need to really l learn that and to accept that, which is not always easy. Uh, but when you get that into your brain, I mean, it's becoming very simple. There I think that it's, when it's all said and done, 
under that con- concept, I just it just hit me that there's really no bad vintages. I mean, yeah, they're white, the vintages are different, and you can say one's more voluptuous than the other, or there's more sugar, whatever the, the character or the profile that wine is for that year. But if the job is, and you do the job right, express that year and express that moment in time, then it's not a bad vintage. It's and you should be able to taste that. And so going back to what we tasted last night, that even after 35 years of doing this, that was the oldest still wine I'd ever tasted. Of 1945. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that's a unique experience for all of us. It's unbelievable. Even for me, I mean, this is a vintage that I don't taste quite often. There is only like uh, 60 bottle left. So that's why I wasn't on the price list when when Norway no, gave. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a treasure that we have been able to to keep and to save for decades now, and uh, that's very interesting for us because it reflects, first of all, that the 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 white wine from this specific region has an ability to age mm, yeah, uh, which is just fantastic i mean i would it wasn't necessarily youthful it shouldn't be it's 80 years old i kept thinking that while i was sitting there i was almost speechless like this is 80 years old i mean and it had plenty of life yeah there was plenty of acid and it, and it didn't even have any oxidation really it just had mellowed and turned into what it was but more exciting is you know the time and place right and, and i think wine is, is the only product that I can think of that you can take halfway across the world. You can bring 6,000 miles and say, this is, this is who we were in 1945. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing else that can do that. And the vintage was uh, considered as probably among the very best vintages of the, the last really? century. I mean, uh, wow. and the reason is probably because we didn't do much. To achieve yeah, right. That. You <laughs> know, like there was no no people, no no men to work the field on that specific year, um, and that's probably explained that Mother Nature took control um, and did a great job. You know, and that's exactly what we are trying to do: not to 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 be uh, uh, willing to do always a little bit more or to 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 express something different what, compared to what the, the soil can give. It's kind of interesting when you say that. The best finish here we have all this technology now and we're, we're going to get into grand cruise here in a second and all, sort of the alsatian uh, approach to the marketplace the worldwide market of wine but it's kind of interesting when you say this is the best vintage of the century of course uh, you know the bordelais like to say that all the time but whatever they <laughs> <laughs> it's we didn't have all the technologies the, the it's kind of like going back to the monks uh, of, of burgundy you know identifying these small hectare parcels of land that produced uh, you know, a particular style of Pinot Noir than others. And without all the chemicals, without all of the refractors, without all the things it takes in today's marketplace, but we still come up in 1945 with what might be considered one of the greatest wines of the century. Yeah. And as I wonder, isn't that fascinating? That it is, of that we course. Don't need, it is. We really didn't need all this stuff. Yeah, and probably because the style of the wines was a bit different too. When you look at this specific Riesling Italy from 1945, uh, it gets a little bit more residual sugar compared to what we are doing mm-hmm. nowadays because people didn't have the time to harvest at the right you know, timing as they used to do. So maybe that's also part of the game. They, they didn't really want to, to look for a specific style. It was mm-hmm. as it was back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I guess it's, more, it's becoming more important to be more precise because, as we said before, the, the, the climate is changing too. It's becoming yeah. way more extreme. And I tend to say because we are independent wine growers, so we don't buy any grapes, we don't buy any juice. And to be in full control, you need to take decision at the right time. Uh, and especially looking at the picking dates. I mean, that gives you the style of the, the, the final wine uh, when it's done right away. You know that if you collect the grapes when it's fully ripe, not too, too early, not too late, then you don't need to do much. You mm-hmm. just need to make sure that you n- don't lose part of this quality in the process. Right. And this is where the technology takes place, is just to avoid losing quality in the cellar. And that's becoming well, key, of course, for the consistency of the wines. I suppose uh, being that we tasted two Pinot Noirs last night that were incredible, completely different wines. Um, you know, I had a nice conversation with a gentleman next to me about you know, the characteristic of these wines and being such a finicky grape and something new for you guys. I mean, how many vintages of Pinot Noir have you made or have you brought to the market? I think it's the first one, right? Uh, I mean, we produce Pinot Noir in Alsace for, for ages. For a long time. But, but 
now we believe that thanks to global warming or thanks to the, the proper uh, condition that we have nowadays, it's becoming easier to reach the ripeness of the fruit and, and to bring some character to our Pinot Noir. So um, a grasta. A yeah. grass de, is a, now a cause de, a grass de. Yes, <laughs> exactly. You. I mean, <laughs> thanks to or because of, I don't know, but in, yeah. in our, uh, in our uh, region, at least, uh, Pinot Noir has a great potential. And not so long ago, Pinot Noir has been accepted among the Grand Cru terroir to become really? Pinot Noir Grand Cru. So mm. that's brand new. And that's also make a big statement to say now we believe into Pinot Noir, we are able to achieve great Pinot Noir in Alsace, uh, and that's just the beginning of a new story for us. Is that uh, Did I taste a whole berry fermentation in one of those wines, uh, carbonic maceration? or? Yes, there was a little bit of carbonic yeah, I, maceration. I, I uh, sense that. Yeah, and that's also the techniques that we are experimenting now. Uh, and... I mean, the, the, the key for success is very simple. You want to reduce the yield in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you manage your vineyards in a way that the vines doesn't produce much, but highly concentrated juice. And then you need to get influenced by the people who are doing that for way longer than yeah, us right. <laughs> to get the right <laughs> recipe in the cellar. Uh, but it's very exciting for us. You know, Pinot Noir is the only red varietals that we are able to use in Alsace into the appellation system. So we have the, the only sh chance that we have to produce a red one is to use Pinot Noir. And it's at all levels of designated. Grand Cru, is it? So t let's talk about that for a second. And I want to get into a little bit of the history of more. But the, the Grand Cru designation, when did they appellate uh, Alsace? And what's your arrangement? So first of all, we, we, we have lost... 150 years because of the German and French history. Mm -hmm. So when Burgundy and Bordeaux started to put in place their appellation system, we were sometimes German, sometimes French. So we yeah, had to so wait <laughs> that the, 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 so to get some stability in the region. And the first appellation for SS is 19, 1962. Wow. It's really young. So it's really. very young appellation, yeah. which makes the, this appellation to be very strict. So we came late, but with very strong rules mm -hmm. and very strict uh, system. Uh, so the first appellation was to just take into consideration the grapes that were allowed to grow, the yields and so on. Uh, but soon after, they realized that there was a huge difference between the plain of Alsace and the hillside of the, the region. Mm -hmm. So this is where they decided to introduce this Grand Cru appellation. Uh, and that started in 1975. It was really young. Really. Very young. Wow. Uh, and, you know, like in just a few years, they decided to select 25 Grand Cru in Alsace. And among those 25 Grand Cru, we've been very lucky to get four Grand Cru classified in our single city, Gebwiller. Wow. So right. that's unique. This is still the only city in Alsace which counts four different Grand Cru sites. Has the world of wine accepted this? I mean, they I mean, could they have, understand it. They I asked have, that question last night, but I, you know, I didn't know that there was Grand Cru in the Alsace or had been explained to me what it was. Yeah, and I mean, it has been well accepted to select a few Grand Cru. Of course, then the designation of them is always a debate. Yeah, uh, we could have probably get more because the terroir is the same all over the mountain mm -hmm. but to avoid a second french revolution they say this is enough yeah. for you guys uh but i barely got through the first book now i gotta read the second one. <laughs> <laughs> but soon after they started with the 25 grand cru mostly in the southern part of alsace because there is this rain shadow effect uh, thanks to the, the the local mountain but soon after they decided to double the amount of grand cru so now we have 51 grand cru altogether Wow. For, for a small region like Alsace. So it seems like a big numbers, but it's important to recall that all those Grand Cru produce altogether only 4% of the total production of the region. Wow. Exactly like in Burgundy. Yeah. So we still consider that producing those Grand Cru uh, is really reaching the highest level of quality that you can get in the region. It's a very small production. I mean, the, the, the yields are divided by two. Uh, so you get more concentration. Uh, it's way more terroir-oriented. And the reason we have so many Grand Cru is explained also by the, 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 the very um, uh, complex geology that we have in the region. 
we count 13 different types of soil on a single region, mm -hmm. very small. So we had to, to separate those different locations because they are so different that they produce different style of wines. You know, recently, uh, is the noble white grape of Alsace, right? Is the Gewurztraminer, Riesling, Sylvaner. I mean, the noble grapes considered uh, to be used into the Grand Cru appellation is the Riesling, Pinot Gris, Gewurztraminer, and Muscat. And Muscat. Okay. But Muscat is a very, very small uh, proportion of the, the production. It's less than 3%. So usually when we talk about Grand Cru, uh, we talk about Riesling, Pinot Gris, and Gewurz, and now we talk about Pinot Noir as well. Well, and, well, Pinot Noir being extraordinarily um, indicative of where it's grown and how it's grown and it, a very finicky grape. But recently, uh, you know, I don't know it as, and I want you to explain this, it do, is very versatile, right? It can produce late harvest botrytis wines. It can produce sparkling wines. It can produce dry, you know, demi-sec wines as well. Um, but is it accepted by the wine community um, as this noble flexible grape or is it sort of still kind of focused in Alsace and Austria and uh, I would say that for Alsace at least uh, 90% or even more than that of the Riesling produced in the region are dry style so this mm -hmm. is really what Alsatian producers uh, have, ach has, have achieved uh, for many decades now so there is a few exceptions of course you can find a, a sweeter Riesling in the region late harvest for example or Selection de Grenoble but when you see Alsace and Riesling on the same label, you can be almost sure that the wines we've finished right. So that's mm -hmm. very helpful for the consumer as well mm -hmm. to say, okay, if we are not too sure, we go to Alsace section and we are, we are sure that the wines will finish dry. Because is it indicative of, is it like Pinot Noir as a grape? I mean, Chardonnay yeah, certainly it has, you know, everything's you know, terroir driven, but certain grapes have more capability of, of presenting that to the in the bottle. Is Riesling one of those that it really drives? It considers to be, for us, at least the king of the grape in Alsace yeah. uh, because it, it has this ability to reflect its terroir. And the reason f for me is because, first of all, uh, as it's produced mainly dry, uh, you, get, you don't get confused by the little touch of residu residual sugar that you can get sometimes. And the grapes itself is made for it. I mean, uh, you, you take the same vintage, and that's what we ex experiment every single year. You take the same vin uh, the same grapes coming from different terroir, you use the exact same recipe, and mm -hmm. at the end, the wines will be totally different. Wow. So that's, that's, that's fantastic. It's difficult to explain. Uh, it's almost impossible to explain, but it works. I mean, every year, and you, you get like a print of each terroir, you know, like a specific identity to it that is the same over and over again. So That's if I, why we do this, isn't it? Yeah. Because every year we get to try something new and, yeah. and get and fascinated by it. Just to get into like the details of the different Riesling Grand Cru that we can produce, we have some on limestone that will give with some aging a little bit of this petrol or gasoline you know, type of taste. Uh, we have some on sandy soil, which brings some uh, uh, saline, you know, salinity on mm -hmm. the finish. And we have some on volcanic stones, which gives a touch of smokiness wow. and complexity to yep. it. So depending on the terroir, you have the same print, and but the expression is totally different. You know, I sat here for 35 years, literally, and every Tuesday would taste wine. And I always considered those Tuesdays, unless I was sick or out of town, I we did it. And I always considered sort of this... Um, spotlight on what was going on in the market what they were bringing me with the nor what noreen would bring me or what another rep would bring me would be sort of indicative of what's popular and so and you see varieties come and go like australian wines came and went the prices got too high then they dropped down now they have yellow town they go back and forth sancerre you know yeah. you, you couldn't give sancerre away 10 years ago and now it's like the most popular thing in the world and its prices have gone through the roof where do you think alsace is in this sort of market trend what have you sensed worldwide where alsatian wines are that's a very good question i mean of course we believe into alsace of course no, <laughs> and, I mean, but and I wonder... no doubt that the, the time has come for alsace yes. in my opinion we've been very patient but uh <laughs> time has come <laughs> for many reasons uh we had we are at the cross of all the trends when you look at 
what's happening in the world right now as has tick all the marks. I mean, people drink more and more whites, mm -hmm. generally speaking, more and more whites. Uh, people take care of what they eat and what they drink. So they want something a little bit lighter in style, something, mm -hmm. you know, not too big in alcohol. Uh, so Alsace is really the only region in the world able to produce such a diversity of white wine. We produce dry Pinot Blanc, Riesling. Uh, you know, we produce wines with just a touch of roundness to it. And we produce some extremely sweet wines. So we can really cover the full spectrums of white wines in a very narrow and single region. So I guess if you look for white wines, if you go to Alsace, you can be sure to find, you know, what you expect. Something you like. Yeah. And you're right. The, the trend, and again, you know, consumerism drives this thing. And so the trend for lower alcohol wines, some, uh, frankly, personally, don't understand non-alcohol wines because yeah. they don't taste very good and they don't, what's the point? But regardless, um, it's like decaf coffee. Like, what, <laughs> why would you bother? But the uh, the idea of low alcohol wines is popular. Yeah. Um, and, and look, also at the, sorry, but look also at the trends on what people are uh, are cooking or what they eat. Yes. I mean, it's a lot of uh, fusion cuisine, you know, with inspiration from the entire world. Uh, you get some sometimes a touch of spiciness in the, the food, sometimes a little bit less. But all those fantastic aromatic wines from Alsace mm -hmm. can be ideal pairings for those type of food. Uh, there is not a single dish that we cannot pair with wines from Alsace. And that's Last night was wine. a great example. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Chinese food, a, a huge spectrum from Peking duck to yeah, you it's know, incredible. To squid. It was quite fascinating to and taste. Especially... Uh, Using dry wrestling with the duck yeah, is something that was amazing, right? people will never think about it, but it works perfectly well. So I'm strongly convinced that the time has come for Alsace to, to stand a little bit more. And this is what we always believe, but it reflects what people are doing and living now. I mean, it's really something that we need to, we need to spread the word because we, we've been ready for a long time. But now I guess this is a, a perfect time for Alsace. Well, that's why you're here during harvest, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because no, this it's an interesting point. Um, because because what I did was all marketing. You know, we were a marketing company that sold wine, and the original premise of the company was to taste everything we could taste, find the best values in the market because there were really good values that were unexplored. Yes, and that's changed considerably in the last ten years with, you know, really inexpensive. Spanish whites coming to America in you know in a bladder and they're bottling and all these brands, and so I think what you're doing today in this trip is probably what has to be done and most critical in part of like this Les Amis event, yes. which was my father's. Uh, he was a chapter out of 150 chapters in America, and and the, it was a wine enthusiast group. People got together and they talked about things. Yes, and how how better could it be for a brand like Schlumberger to have people sit like we did last night, taste the wines, have the conversation, uh, taste the pairings, and get an appreciation for the story. Yeah. Because the story's not, I bought it on the internet. That's not a story. No, that's true. And there is uh, memories to be recalled. Yes. There is like, uh, you know, conversation that cannot be done only online. You need to talk to people. You need to experience the wines. You need to do something to, to make it life easier for everyone to understand the, the region, the wines that we're producing. And don't get me wrong, I, I know that Alsace sounds a little bit complicated sometimes because it's very diverse. Yeah. But at the end, it's very easy because we use the name of the grapes on the label, for example. This is the only region in Alsace. That's in a France, really good point to, even think of that. To use You're a European grapes. group with the, name, with the grape name. Yeah. Not and just for the Americans. No, not, <laughs> not only for you guys this time. But uh, now that's very interesting. And when you get to know that the Riesling are dry, the Pinot Gris can be you know, some, somewhere in between and the Gewürz a little bit more aromatic and expressive, yes. then you get it. That's it. It's very simple. You know, it's funny. When I was talking to the gentleman next to me. Uh, Gewürztraminer was reasonably popular when I started doing this and sort of in the first probably 15 years, but I don't think I've tasted a Gewürztraminer probably in the last 10 years from anywhere in the world. That's so come I'm, through. My I'm glad I came for that. Huh? Yeah, I, really, <laughs> it was great to taste again. But up until that point too as well, they weren't wonderfully finessed, complex, dry ones like yours. Uh, the California version of Gewürztraminer became this sweet thing with yes. lots of spice. You know, it had 
Vert's character, but it was still uh, high sugar. You know, he said something yesterday about the, the 45, that it had a reasonable amount of sugar, which you did not sense. I didn't sense the, the cloying character of yes. sugar in that wine, but you said it was rather high. And It was actually very high compared to what, what we are doing now, wow. uh, just because, we, as we say, like the, the, the grapes remain on the, the vines for a little bit longer. Uh, but then, over time, this sugar gets melted into the wine. So it's, you don't get it as right. uh, you probably will get it if you, we were tasting the wines 10 years after it has been produced. But now, I mean, that's probably also helps for the preservation of the wine, you know, to get a little bit sure, residual sure, sugar into preserved. it. But uh, as you mentioned it before, and I guess this is key for people to understand, is that after 80 years, to have such an amount of liveliness in the glass... Is something that always surprising surprised me. I mean, it's unbelievable. It gives you a kick, even though yeah. the wine is so old. Plenty of acid. That, yeah. that kind of goes back to, um, you know, if a, if a wine is bottled out of balance, it will remain out of balance. That's and true. Then it could have been undrinkable at this point because the balance was so messed up. But this, my first comment to the gentleman next to me was, this is still has balance. Yes. So and, and how did how did your great grandfather bottle it? with such balance without the technology that goes back to the other conversation that, that's amazing to me yeah I don't have any answer regarding did they record, that did they record the metrics back then share no, content no. bricks none of that stuff we right? have nothing just nothing pick about it, it. <laughs> yeah, they pick it and we don't even know how they managed to do it because again I mean there was nobody left to, to take so care of the land the timeline of that would be um, if the uh, I forgot the, May was the wasn't it Paris liberated in May yeah and Get Villers a little bit earlier. So it was picked um, before that. No, no, it, it was, was picked it, after that. After that, so yeah. the harvest is in. Yeah, in, it was harvest you, was going. So this probably around blood break and all that. Back then, it was probably harvesting in October, mid October, nineteen forty-five. Uh, nowadays, we are collecting the grapes at least a month in advance compared well, to what we used to do 20 years ago. So what do you think? You know, the, yes, climate change is real. I don't think anybody can argue with that. And, and I'm, this is not a political show, so we're not going to discuss why we think it's happened. But, Thank you. you know, these, these <laughs> seems... <laughs> but I mean, Champagne... You know, well, I think most of France went through a cold snap for like 15 years in the late 1700s, you know, during the, sh the Champagne, particularly affected by this. I mean... You just deal with what you've been given, yeah. And you know, going back to Agraste, you know, you get now you have Pinot Noir that people will enjoy, and and the English can make sparkling wine now. That's true. And Belgium is planting like Riesling and really? Pinot Blanc. Yeah, I mean, things are shifting a little bit towards north. Well, that's uh, interesting. Which makes sense in a way. I mean, uh, yeah. When you look at what we used to produce in Alsace. Uh, centuries ago, that was not the same grapes, that was not the same style of wines. So th there, there has always been an evolution over time. And we have always adapted our techniques, our varietals, everything related to the climate. And this is not the first time that the, the climate no, is changing. changing. So. There's something else that I think is important to, to talk about. Um, that I think traditionally people say the terroir is the soil and the weather and the picking decisions and the bud break and all the things that go into you know the environmental part of wine. But you have to believe that. Um, well, I'll put it another way: your your great grandfather saw a lot, right? He he had to deal with a lot politically. He had to deal with a lot in the vineyard. He had to figure out how to pick the grapes. There probably there's no labor to do that. All the, everybody was coming back from the war, um, and that those stories are handed down the reaction to particular events in your life are going to be mandated by your previous experiences. And so cannot we say that all those experiences handed down to you show up in the bottle somehow? Some decision to do something, to, be, to react some way, create your approach to what you're going to put in the bottle. I totally agree on that. I mean, of course, like the, the, the way we have been... Uh, educated, the way, the, the surrounding that we have around us and so on, that's, of course, reflects the, the, the vision or the philosophy that you have for the future. And that's, uh, that's exactly what we have in mind. At our generation, I tend to say that we are the luckiest one. We yeah. didn't face any war. Uh, our great-grandfather, our parents, my uncle, left a company which is in perfect shape. It never has been 
such in a good shape as it is today. So we feel very fortunate about yeah. it. Now how you make, how you put your stone, you know, to the wall. How, how you can give something for the next generation, and that that's exactly what we are always looking for. That's exactly what we try to reflect with the launch of this new cuvée that we tasted last night, mm -hmm. uh, which is coming from the same terroir, the same Grand Cru Quiterlé from 1945 that we are playing now in a very specific location, a very small part of this magical Grand Cru to produce what we wish to be like our next iconic wine. And the 45 that we tasted yesterday was a selection of this Grand Cru. So that was the, the oldest version of it. And now we bring to the market the new version of it, which is, of course, full of... Uh, uh, not technology, but, you know, full of details. And it's, it's the addition of those details which makes the wines to be completely different and maybe m more quality-oriented. It was different, completely different, and it had a wonderful... The finish was... I kept wanting to taste that wine to sense the finish because just before it finished, there was this wonderful complexity that obviously was terroir-driven, and I was just kept wanted to taste it over you, you how do we how do we explain you know part, there's this whole thing in the in the world of wine right now because of the internet because of digital marketing because of instantaneous ads because of uh, targeted ads um you know we've we were fighting against and the reason i sold my company last year about this time was i did not i, I was not going to go into the the basement of this industry and f slug it out with people that are selling wine for $15 that they paid, you know, 50 cents a liter for. I just, yeah. I wasn't going to get into that part of the business, but, and those people will always exist, but we want to get this into the hands of the people that will have that same experience. I had may not be able to explain it. Um, I, you know, I was trying to define the words, not important. Uh, sensing it is important. You know, if, a lot of people can't explain it. That's okay. But they go, what? What is this? How do we do that? How do we just doing what you're doing today, going around, putting on dinners, uh, educating the vendors, educating the distributors, um, to get them to get it in the hands of a sommelier? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you need to 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 get your vision of what you want to do, uh, and and that's not that easy. I mean, for us, like. Coming out with a, a new cuvee like the Clos Saint Léger that we are mm -hmm. releasing now on the 17 vintage has been uh, my first mission when I joined the company in 2010. So it it take it takes at least 10 to 15 years to achieve what you were looking for. So we are talking about almost like a, a full generation mission to to bring something new. And, wow. and for us, of course, the most difficult part is to achieve that, to be very picky and demanding to, to the, the vineyards, but also to the team, to do the best that they can offer to make a wine which is, uh, you know, like very precise, very racy, very nice, like a, a, a wonderful wrestling as we expect the Kiterle can show. Uh, and then, of course, we need to talk about it. And you're exactly right. I mean, you need to spread the words, to talk to people, to make it, uh, to make them taste the wine, and to to un to explain what we do. I mean, there is no way we're gonna change people's taste. That's no. for sure. Right. But the least we can do is to explain how much how much energy we put into it, what is the philosophy behind, and so on. And that's exactly the purpose of this trip. Is 2010. Who hired who? Did you hire your sister? Or did your sister hire you? Uh, she, she was there before <laughs> me. And actually, my uncle uh, you was You passed the interview, it sounds like. You. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Luckily, I did, I did pass the interview. And uh, I'm the youngest from uh, my generation. So uh, I'm the number four out yeah. of four kids. And uh, no, I mean, I get very lucky that my parents didn't, you know, very much push us into that direction. So I did many things before joining the, the winery. We didn't even talk about that. I, I, I consider myself very fortunate and blessed by my father, and I'm the youngest as well, yeah. uh, to say, you're, you know, go do what you want. But when the time came, he says, I think no, you got to come check this yeah. out. And, you know, it was the best decision I ever made. Exactly. I feel exactly the same. I got the chance to work a, a little bit in the perfume industry, you know, in Grasse, in the capital of perfume. Uh, you know, I didn't have any clue that 
it will be so close to the wine industry yeah, at the right. end. But you know, just exper experimenting something different, building your own way, uh, really is a strength when you you take over a, a company like ours. I mean, it's it's a big boat. I mean, Domaine Schumberger is the largest private owned winery in Alsace. Uh, oh wow! I didn't know that. Yeah, so it's I mean that's it's that's a big project. It's fifty people uh, working. That's very with us. big. It's big. So to get the chance to do something else before you know being dropped into this world uh, is very something that was important to me. There's been actually I've had a, quite a few um, winemakers, family people in the show that had been in luxury products as well prior, whether it was leather or fashion perfume. Yeah. Um, it, it's, there is synergy to branding and marketing products like that and wine. Yes, I believe so, because, I mean, it's just a question of, I mean, like fashion, like arts, uh, it's trying to, to express something uh, with your own education, your own philosophy, but again, in the best possible way. Right. It was it was it was sent it was said to me by a very young woman who was running a winery in Armenia and I'm headed to Armenia on Friday uh, to do a show on wine there uh, an industry that's crazy industry because it's you got to call it old world since they found a winery that was unearthed that was six thousand years old and they found the winemaker's shoes there uh, but uh, because the USSR the the, the it, it was stagnant nothing happened they made brandy for the whole time during the Soviets. And now the technology has come and they've got, you know, a hundred new wineries in the place. And so it's kind of an interesting irony between yeah. them. But this young woman runs the largest, probably the largest winery there called Karas. And she said, and this goes back to what you did yesterday. She goes, what other product in the world can you take around the world? And we talk about that, but plop it on the table and say, this is who we are. Yes. And when we were. And there isn't anything. That's fantastic. And that's why you're here today, which yeah. I really appreciate. We're out of time already, which is hard to believe. But incredible conversation. And I hope we get a chance to do it again. I and hope so, too. Thank you so much, Paul. I mean, it has been a great pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. And thank you for your time and give, give, giving us the chance to talk about Alsace. Because, again, it's an underrated place. And I guess the time has come for people to experiment well, it. We're going to wave change. the flag, too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. All right.